Okay, um, today we're going to paint a high key painting. We're looking at the pottery over there, and there's different flavors, just slightly. I'm going to point that out right quick. This one is a cooler white. If you'll notice, it tends to be bluer if you had to pick a color. This is a more yellow white ish color. We're also on a tablecloth, and you have to decide what color that is compared to that, compared to that. And it feels a little warmer, maybe, than the little cup here. This little guy is in the shadow, so he's going to be much darker. And then I've got a little glass back there to support the characters that are going on here. Just pay attention to the shadows that are here on the table. And then the background color also is another creamy colored yellow. Warm versus cool. So this is warm and this is cool. I would say this would be a little warmer, but if I had to choose this compared to that, this would be cooler compared to that. So these are things you have to ask yourself while you're making decisions while you're painting. So I'm working on an 11 by 14 canvas. This is an example of what a high key painting is right here. Um, and that's usually everything that's going to be from the middle, middle value over to the left side of your scale, or if you have one going a different direction. Um, low key is going to be always in the darker area. We're not doing that today, but we may use these as a little mixture. And then middle key is when you're working in the middle part of the value scale. So I've set this up in a, an almost the correct value so that it will explain how to have color relate to value. Because color is different, of course, or tone. Some people call it tone and value. And it's just like a, if you play music, it's like having little little music, mu little musical notes. So I am going to sketch the pot on there. I'm going to decide, I think I'm, I'm working in a narrow canvas, which is not a little bit different for this little scene. I'm going to make the table top about right there. And I'll probably have my little cup setting off the top. So this will be the back of the table, I think. I changed my mind. So if this is the front of the table, then I'll have the back of the table about here, probably. Just drawing the outline for the edges. This is the top of the, the middle pot. So I can measure an angle and come over here and make sure. So I'm measuring the angle of the top of the pot to the edge of the pot, the teapot, and where the glass might sit. So once I decide where about the angles from the top of the pot to the edge of the cup, down to the bottom of the cup, to the front of the creamer, over. It's actually more like a line like this, but I'm going to bring him in a little further. I'm going to drop the table line right here. I'm using magenta. That's my color. I don't always use magenta, but I'm using it today for my undertone. 
And what I would recommend is for you to use a transparent undertone. And you can choose any of your transparent colors. These are, these are transparent. These are opaque or semi-opaque. But these are, have white in it and these do not. Okay, now I'm going to sketch some. So when you're sketching, you can still hold your brush up to see how slight an angle is or how straight an angle is. I like to measure where the top of the handle is in relation to the top of the pot. So this little guy will come up a little bit taller. He's the main guy, girl, whatever you want to give it in the scene. So he's the biggest and largest, demands the most attention. And when I am sketching a, a pot or anything round, a cup, a saucer, I will not put these, um, the little spout in until the end because I want to make sure my sides here are going to be exactly the same. So I'm not even putting in my cup yet. I'm just making sure that I am proportionate with this cup. I mean the uh, pot. So the little handle goes a little bit below. The handle. Or the spout goes a little below the handle. So everything is in relationship. The pot cup, the creamer that's sitting off by itself, but most things are in a relationship, which means they touch or overlap. So when you're doing an, um, something like this with a round ellipse, you can also, to help you, you could divide the ellipse in half and it mirrors itself. So whatever you go down, whatever angle it is, you go down or around this, you go also on the top. And this is my point of view, so that. And always make sure your ellipse is on the bottom when they're touching the tabletop that they're not flat. That makes it look a little strange. So you want to give it a little bit of a roundness, maybe not quite like the top, but you want to make it look like it's an ellipse. Don't flatten it out on the ground. All right, so now we're going to the cream. Again, the creamery, I would also look at this thing. It's, it is a, an ellipse or a around item. If you if it helps you to draw a line in the center, you can, just like we did here. I didn't do that here. But just to make sure you're getting the shape correct on both sides. Now I'll put the little spout on. And I'll also sketch with little straight lines instead of round lines. Always consider, I don't mind this handle going off the edge either. I think that's going to be interesting. This spout looks a little large to me, so I'm going to reduce that.
So when you get things sketched, you always measure it in your eye. Just what's wrong with that, maybe, or what's right. Maybe you've got everything correct. Don't wait until you get the paint on there to correct things. I'm going to make him a little more robust. Again, not a straight line, but a little bit of a curve. The glass, I like to go ahead and mark where it is, kind of sketch it in there, but it will end up being more of a, a hint of something back there. So since he's sitting on the edge, I may bring the table up a little higher. All right, now that I've got that sketched, I will now fill in what I feel like are the dark areas. So I have a two-tone painting by the time I get done. And when I say dark areas, we're still talking in this higher key. So if you, it's not as obvious, you need to squint your eyes down to see the dark shadows, and of course you know where your light source is, so your dark shadow would be on the left, because right now our light is coming from the right. So in your, in your cup, you always have, it's almost like you could, you almost cut it in half, because the dark on the inside is on the top inside, and the dark on the outside is here, so it's shadow. This looks dark for me, mostly all inside. And then you have really nothing else back there. So also consider your shadows. And put your shadows in. It's all part of the, of the painting. I have people all the time ask me about their shadow shapes. Sometimes they can see two or three shadows, they can see five shadows, and it's usually a, a light problem, a light source problem. And so what I tell them to do is to cut off all the lights and only have one light source. That really helps. So if I wipe out my lines, this will be the basic pattern of what I'm painting. I'm also going to make it shadow down here where the tabletop is. Darker. This is an underpainting, so I'm not really concerned about my brush strokes right here. If I decide I want to put in some folds later, I'll put that in there. And I'm not going to do the shadows in the back right now. I might end up putting them in there later, but if I don't think they're going to participate in the painting, and help out, I don't put them in there. 